This video is starting out once we've already dissected out the stomach and are starting to make our conduit. We will typically uh, start at the lesser curvature and we use a four centimeter silk tie uh, on the stomach and you can see that there. We use this to gauge the width of our conduit to make sure we're not getting too narrow or uh, too wide. We'll also typically use 45 millimeter staple loads instead of 60 loads. We feel like this gives us better control over the length of the conduit, prevents us from making it too narrow or too wide, and also um, theoretically helps us make it a little bit longer as well. At this point, we've completed stapling off our conduit and we typically would uh, suture the specimen to the conduit. And you can see us doing that here. Uh, the conduit is on the bottom part of the screen and the specimen on the top part. We'll typically use two figure eight sutures to prevent any kind of twisting and sufficiently affix the conduit to the specimen. Our idea with doing this is that when we pull up the conduit and specimen to the chest, by having this tied into two places, we would prevent any theoretical twisting along uh, just one suture line. It also prevents us from tearing any tissue and gives us an added suture to help pull up the conduit. Here we have a still shot showing us injecting the pylorus with Botox. The, uh, for orientation, the uh, needle is coming in from a 5 millimeter assistant port at the level of the mid to anterior axillary line. Here we are using uh, the needle to inject the posterior part of the pylorus. We typically inject 100 units of Botox mixed with 4 ml of saline using 1 ml for each quadrant. Uh, we use a 20 gauge needle, mediastinoscopy aspirating needle affixed to a 5 ml syringe. It's important to create a wheel in the muscular portion of the pylorus at each point and avoid injecting a vessel. We tend not to do coker maneuvers. Uh, our thought is that this can actually dysfunction the pylorus and the uh, intestine and may cause additional reflux. Here what we do is we actually uh, have two marking sutures that we place on the conduit. You'll see in our later video how we use these to gauge how much of the conduit we've been able to pull up into the chest, as oftentimes it can be misleading how much length you have or may have left still in the abdomen. At this point, uh, for the sake of time, we fast forwarded to the chest. Uh, we actually uh, have finished here dissecting out the esophagus. To the uh, left is the spine, the azagus is currently being grasped, and the head would be up to the north. The, you're in the right chest, and so the lung is actually over on the right side of the picture there, just for orientation. We typically ligate the azagus. Uh, there are a few reasons we do this. One, oftentimes the anastomosis is right in this area, and ligating the azagus gives us a better view. Additionally, uh, there's some thought that if the azagus were to be engorged, they can actually cause pressure on the conduit or the anastomosis. Here you can see the cut end of the azagus vein on the left um, and actually the airway, uh, you can see the membranous part of it right there going down to the lung. It's important to avoid using any kind of heat or cautery in this area as the membranous part of the trachea can be susceptible to injury. Here we are pulling up the specimen uh, given that this will be taken out, uh, you can grasp these with the caudier or the prographs with impunity. Here we are pulling it up. And just for orientation, we're looking in the right chest down towards the hiatus. Uh, to the right is the lung there, and the uh, spine is on the left. This is the specimen being pulled up, and you can see here where we sutured our conduit to our specimen. It's actually interesting right here, you can actually see a little 180 degree twist of the conduit as we're pulling up. The way to detect this is again looking from the right chest, your staple line should be facing towards you. This doesn't prevent a, 100, or a 360 degree twist 
which can occur as well, as illustrated in this diagram. Once the conduit is in the chest, we avoid grasping it with the caudier or the progress as these can uh, cause some traumatic injury. Here we have the conduit in the chest. It looks like we have a fairly good amount of length, but if you remember back to our marking sutures, we only see one there. And so we know that we actually have a little bit more conduit to be able to pull into the chest. Again, for orientation, the lung is on the right, spine is on the left, when the right chest looking down at the crura. You can see us pinching the conduit, and there is our second marking suture. And we're able to get a little bit more length from our conduit to make sure we have a tension-free anastomosis. There are several ways to pull up the conduit. You can use the very end of it to pull it up, a forced or ring, two prographs as you can see in this image, or sometimes you can actually use a uh, rolled up Raytec or Surgicel as a buffer uh, to prevent any kind of traumatic tearing of the conduit. This illustration uh, shows actually once we've incised the esophagus, we'll typically use a Foley catheter with about 30 ml of water to dilate the lumen. Our idea here is that we're able to dilate the esophagus a little bit more so it can more easily take the 29 millimeter anvil. You can also use this Foley to gauge what size of anvil that it will take. Uh, so if we're able to get a little bit larger or smaller. Here we are placing the anvil into the cut esophagus. Again, for orientation, the head of the patient is at the top of the screen. We're in the right chest. The spine is on the left and the lung. You can see just a bit of it on the bottom right side of the screen. We've already cut the specimen out, and this is the uh, cut end of the esophagus. Here you can see us using a 3O proline on SH needle to uh, baseball stitch the mucosa and the submucosa. Uh, this provides a uh, purse string for the anvil. We then do a second uh, concentric purse string of the same suture about five millimeters away from the last one to further secure uh, the anvil to the proximal esophagus. If you take too much tissue uh, from wide bites, this can make firing of the EEA and the creation of the anastomosis difficult uh, in that, that the tissue uh, that the staple must pass will be too thick and there can be a misfiring. At this point, we've actually finished our anastomosis. What we typically do is insert the EEA stapler through the cut end of the conduit as kind of a candy cane anastomosis. We've already filed it here and are now using sutures to add a reinforcing uh, layer to our anastomosis. We see in the uh, illustration here that we like to over sew our staple line uh, with several interrupted sutures. We like to wrap our anastomosis with a pedicle of momentum uh, to hopefully promote some healing and prevent any kind of leakage uh, if a leak were to occur. We'll typically secure our anastomosis to the pleura as well to prevent it from any excessive movement. Here we are in the right chest. Again, you can see the lung to the right there and the spine to the left. And what we're doing is we're actually tacking the conduit to the diaphragm. And finally, uh, here we are in the right chest looking down towards the diaphragm. You can see the conduit at the bottom of the screen coming towards us. The heart would be on the left side. And we actually use a suture here to tighten the crura. Again, our hope is that we prevent any kind of uh, hiatal hernia from occurring.